1915, the French fitted a plane with a machine gun firing through the propeller arc. It was a devastating weapon. Germany discovered the secret and built the world's first real fighter, the deadly Fokker Eindecker. The Fokker scourge began. France answered with the agile Newport, and the war in the air became a race for technical superiority. early 1915, military aviation was making powerful friends among the military hierarchy in Paris. In March, the Battle of Neuve Chapelle was fought entirely on the basis of maps made from aerial photographs. Bombers were coordinated with infantry for the first time. General Joff, the French chief of staff, became convinced that aircraft could be the tool to break the deadlock of the trenches. By the time the winter weather cleared and conditions became better for flying, the French air service was well on the way to being reorganized, based on the lessons of 1914. Photo reconnaissance units were centralized. Mechanical support was improved. The air service was split into three groups, fighting, bombing, and reconnaissance. There was an Allied air base on the coast near the port of Dunkirk called Saint Paul sur Mer. On April the 1st, 1915, it was the location for an event of great significance to fighter aircraft. France's pre war aviation hero, Roland Garros, was stationed there. He was trying out an idea that could make machine guns more effective in the air. Steel deflector plates were fitted to the propeller of a Moran Saulnier N. A machine gun was fitted to fire straight ahead through the propeller arc. In every 100 bullets, about seven would hit the deflector plates and bounce away. The whole plane could be aimed at the enemy. Garros tried the system in combat on April the 1st, fitted to a Moran Saulnier L. It worked. He shot down three German planes in three weeks. On April the 18th, he took off from Dunkirk again. But this time he wasn't so lucky. His plane was brought down behind German lines. The secret was out. Germany asked Tony Fokker, the young aircraft designer, to improve on the French system. And he did just that. The Fokker team synchronized gun and propeller, allowing all the bullets through the blades. They fitted the system to a Fokker single-seater and renamed the plane the E-1. E stood for Eindecker, meaning monoplane. The great German pilot Max Immelmann had the first confirmed victory in an E-1. Three weeks later, his colleague Oswald Bürker was successful. Bilka and Immelmann led what became known as the Fokker Scourge through 1915. Their tally of downed Allied aircraft mounted. The German press created a rivalry between them. Bilka's approach was simple. I always wait for the favorable moment and put in a few well-directed shots. Tony Fokker improved the Eindeckers. This is a scaled-down replica of an E3, the ultimate version. It had a 100-horsepower engine and sometimes two machine guns. It appeared in December 1915. Allied fear of the Fokker continued to mount. 
The Royal Flying Corps issued this order. Until we are in possession of a machine as good or better than the German Fokker, a machine on reconnaissance must be escorted by at least three fighting machines. But in some ways Germany squandered the advantage the Fokker gave it. Tactics for fighter aircraft were still to be developed. The Fokkers often hunted alone or in twos. Sometimes, as in this rare film, they took off to provide escort for Avyatik and Argo reconnaissance aircraft. They were held behind German lines to keep the secret of the gun synchronizing system intact. If they'd been organized into strong fighting units, the Fokker scourge could have been much worse. The Germans didn't have things all their own way in the skies above northern France. Allied fighter aircraft may have been outclassed for the moment, but sometimes pure natural talent could beat new technology. Leno Hawker was a British pilot with a reputation as a deadly shot. His observer, who was also the machine gunner, complained that he had the foul habit of carrying an ordinary rifle, which he used to loose off if he didn't think I was doing too well. The noise was most alarming. The two-seater British FE-2 fighter was not the right vehicle for Hawker's marksmanship. In a new single-seat Bristol Scout, he came into his own as a deadly genius in the air. The leader of all pilots in the skies above the Western Front was French, Adolphe Pegou, the inventor of aerobatics. Pegou was shot down and killed in August 1915. His score was six enemy aircraft. He was given a hero's funeral. Even German pilots dropped wreaths from their planes onto his gravesite. In the summer of 1915, a new French fighter appeared. It was used by the French and the British against the menace of the Fokker Eindecker. The Newport 11 was known affectionately by French pilots as the baby. It was small, but very effective. It was originally designed as a racer for the annual Gordon Bennett Cup. But it met the growing needs of the air war perfectly. Although it was the French aircraft, the British government was the first to order it. In July 1915, it went into action with the Royal Naval Air Service in the Dardanelles campaign in Turkey. When it was introduced on the Western Front in the autumn, its speed and maneuverability gave the Allies some hope against the growing menace of the Fokkers. It had one major problem. The V-patterned wing struts allowed the wings to twist under load, sometimes with fatal results. Nevertheless, the Newport Baby very quickly became popular among pilots. It had a fast rate of climb, but its main virtue was extreme agility. By 1915, the many different control systems of Pioneer aircraft had become standardized. A central stick controlled banking, climbing and diving. Rudder pedals coordinated the turn.
The first Newport 11s were powered by Gnome rotary engines of 80 horsepower. Voilà. The Newport had one major disadvantage against the Fokker. French machine guns were not reliable enough in their firing rate for a safe synchronizing system. The Newport's gun could not fire through the propeller arc. The Newport 11 formed the backbone of the new French pursuit squadrons, or escadrilles. The first of these was N65, located near Nancy in the northeast of France. The job of this squadron was to escort French bombers into Germany and defend the skies above Nancy. It was the first true French fighter unit of the war. Apart from the N65 Escadrille, most Newport 11s were operated for the time being in the same way as the Germans used the Fokkers, a supplementary aircraft in two-seater squadrons. The Newport's Lewis machine gun was mounted in the center of the top wing so that bullets cleared the propeller blades. The Newport lagged behind the Fokker in the sophistication of its gun placement, but it had one great advantage, extreme maneuverability. The Fokker, for all the fear it generated, was an old-fashioned wing warper. The light biplane Newport, with its powerful control surfaces, could make moves the Fokker was unable to match. Agility like this could only be exploited by a skilled and naturally gifted pilot. As more sophisticated aircraft became available, a new question needed answering. What characteristics shown by recruits on the ground might indicate a talent for flying in combat? In Germany, France and Britain, there was a belief that ex-cavalrymen made the best pilots. A good horseman needed good hands. So did a pilot. Manfred von Richthofen was a cavalry officer. And so was his brother Lothar. They were both superb combat flyers. But many men who'd never ridden a horse achieved great success in the air. Whatever the elusive natural qualifications for good pilots, they needed development by specialized training. In France, one of the tools was a penguin. A penguin was a plane with shortened wings, capable of almost leaving the ground, but not quite. The theory was the pilot could get the feel of flying without the danger of taking off but there was no avoiding the extreme risk of the first solo flight. For French student pilots early in the war, dual control instruction was rare. They progressed in stages from taxiing to short airborne runs to flights reaching altitudes of about 100 feet. Death in the flying schools was not uncommon. Fatal crashes were never forgotten by those who witnessed them. Rotary engines were a contributing factor. They spin. Gyroscopic forces could be fatal to a pilot turning at low altitude. This is a Caudron G3, used for reconnaissance early in the war and later as a trainer.
Victor Chapman was an American volunteer pilot in France in 1915. He wrote about a takeoff early in his training. The machine left the ground almost immediately. I had to hold it down to keep headway. Then it began to buck, squirm, and wriggle. It slid off to the right, to the left, took a short plunge downward, and then attempted to rear. The earth and a scrawny tree or two looked near and menacing. No country had a perfect training system. Many pilots were underprepared to join the aerial battle. The Caudron G3's successor, the G4, was an ungainly looking addition to the French bomber force. The importance of bombing was growing fast. In April 1915, a new terror was launched into battle. German poison gas caused havoc in the trenches near Ypres, on the Belgian border. Panic spread throughout the Allied forces. There was a poison gas factory at Ludwigshafen in Germany. It was the first target for the French bomber group number one. They had to fly across the Rhine and into the enemy's homeland. The group was based near the city of Nancy in northeastern France, only a few miles from the German border. Its leader was Commandant de Bois. His command was to be short-lived. The raid was planned for early May, but high winds prevented any action until late in the month. On May the 27th, the wind dropped. The bombs for the mission were loaded onto Voisin biplanes. They were modified artillery shells. Bomb sites at the time were crude and unreliable. Bombing techniques were in their infancy. Everybody had a great deal to learn. Prevailing winds were a problem. They blew from west to east. They helped on the way into Germany. But if they became too strong, they could prevent the slow voisins from returning home. Seventeen Voisin bombers left Nancy at 3 a.m. on May the 26th and flew virtually unchallenged into Germany. Eighty-seven bombs were dropped on the factory, causing substantial damage. Only Commandant de Bois failed to make it home. Flights over enemy lines increasingly ran the gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire. As experience with bombing raids grew, formations were favored over the earlier go-as-you-please method. Single aircraft were vulnerable to fire from the ground. A lone aircraft provided one target for many gunners. Large formations forced the gunners to aim at different targets, reducing the chance of each aircraft being hit. Both sides developed new anti-aircraft weapons. By the end of 1915, bombers could no longer go unmolested by ground fire. Winter came again, but there was no lull in hostilities. Germany launched a great offensive that would push the air war in a completely new direction. Germany planned to begin 1916 by making an all-out attack on the fortress city of Verdun. 
twice in just over a century, Verdun had fallen to Germany. As 1916 began, the German trenches were only 10 miles away. The Germans planned a war of attrition to bring the fortress to its knees. Germany believed that France would fight so hard to save Verdun and pour so many men and so much equipment into its defence that the effort would, as the Germans put it, bleed France white. Verdun was defended by two great forts, but at the beginning of 1916, they were under-equipped, both in personnel and armament. Germany assembled a force of one million men and a massive array of heavy artillery to make the attack. The opening move was to be an artillery bombardment, lasting nine hours. France struggled to prepare. When the attack came, the French were outnumbered by the Germans two to one. The artillery bombardment on February the 21st was the heaviest in the history of warfare. The French frontline trenches were destroyed. way was prepared for the German infantry to strike. Germany had a terrible secret weapon, the flamethrower. One of the great forts fell. Panic mounted among the population of the city and the surrounding villages. Commander Verdun was given to General Henri Philippetin, who vowed, They shall not pass. Verdun's lifeline was a road, the Sacred Way. It ran 36 miles to Verdun from bar le duc 6,000 trucks a day kept the city and guns supplied. German aircraft made no attempt to bomb them. bar le duc also benefited from Germany's defensive air tactics. It was not threatened as the Sacred Way's staging point. For five weeks, German soldiers were killed at the rate of one every 45 seconds. The death rate among the French was higher still. By the end of March, 90,000 French and 80,000 Germans were dead. The German Kaiser declared, Savoy will end at Verdun. The sacred way was not bombed because German aerial tactics stressed reconnaissance and defense. This is a Rumpler two-seater of the period. At the beginning of the battle, 168 similar aircraft were assigned to artillery spotting over the city. Each side had more than 500 planes in the area. But Germany was still benefiting from the Fokker scourge. Allied morale was low. Germany considered that the job of its fighters was to protect reconnaissance aircraft. This Rumpler had a film camera mounted between the outer struts. Film of the pilot and the observer in action were taken from that camera. It appears to be genuine operational footage, but the shots of ground activity are from other sources. Another function of German two-seaters at Verdun was to set up a Luftsperre, a barrage of aircraft theoretically impenetrable by the enemy. 
they cruised up and down the front inside the German lines. At first, German fighters were reserved to attack enemy planes that made it through the barrage. But as the need for reconnaissance and artillery observation over the battle zone increased, German tactics became more offensive. For a while, German air supremacy over Verdun grew. By 1916, aerial photography was a sophisticated science. Special cameras were developed by both sides. Whole trench systems were mapped from photographic evidence. Photographic reconnaissance and its companion, artillery observation, developed into the most important roles played by aircraft in the Great War. But information gathering behind enemy lines was a dangerous game. Observers had to be vigilant and know how to shoot. The two-seaters of both sides were slower and less maneuverable than the fighters. Many reconnaissance crews perished in the shell holes of no man's land, brought down by a faster and more nimble opponent. Communication between pilot and observer was by shouting. There were no intercoms and no mufflers on the engines. Hand-delivered bombs of this size did little damage on the ground. As the war progressed, bombing grew into a specialized discipline. Random drops from reconnaissance aircraft became less frequent. Any safe return from a reconnaissance mission was greeted with relief. The crew was not only back in safety for a while, but out of the biting cold of open cockpits. Temperatures at 15,000 feet are about 30 degrees colder than sea level. And there's the chill factor of the wind. Aircraft were still scarce and needed to be prepared quickly for the next mission. The ground crews checked engine and structural condition. Pilot and observer wanted to know the number and location of bullet holes in the fuselage. They were an indication of just how close death had come. Aircraft shared the job of artillery observation with balloons. There was strong rivalry between pilots and balloonists. In a French Caco balloon, an observer could be lifted to more than 4,000 feet. Artillery gunners rarely saw their targets. Artillery observers were their eyes in the sky. In good conditions, they could see 15 miles into enemy territory and talk to the ground crew by telephone. Observers could assess the effect of attacks, give artillery directions, track infantry movements, and watch the enemy's reactions. From late 1915, observers had parachutes, but they were hard to use. About once in a hundred jumps, they'd fail to open. In aircraft, observers transmitted Morse signals to the ground by radio. But aircraft radios of the time could not receive. Visual codes were used for ground signals to aircraft. Germany had its own types of balloon, performing exactly the same function as those of the Allies. As the war went on, balloons on both sides became the targets of armed aircraft. French Lapria rockets, 
air-to-air -air missiles for balloon busting were introduced in 1916. These are fitted to a French Farman two-seater, but some new ports also carry them. As the Battle of Verdun developed, the Allies reassessed the use of aircraft. The RFC's commanding officer, Hugh Trenchard, believed in all-out attack. He said, the sky is too large to defend. The French formed elite fighter squadrons called Les Cigognes, the Storks. Félix Brocard was one of the Stork commanding officers. His talented pilots included René Dorme. Dorme, a native of Verdun, had three victories in the skies above his home city. De La Tour became one of the most famous members of the group. Albert Derlin had his first victory in March at Verdun. France recognized early in the war that elite pilots like these had a value beyond their kills in the sky. Their success could be used as tools to lift morale. Pilots with more than five confirmed kills were called aces. In 1916, France's aces were concentrated in the Segonia Escadrille. A posting to the Storks was considered a great honor. Germany had a similar system in which aces were hailed as heroes. But the British did not approve. In March 1916, the Newport 17, an improved version of the baby, began to reach the front lines. It had a 110 horsepower Lerone rotary engine. It was so agile and could climb so much faster than the Fokkers that Germany ordered it to be copied. Germany reacted to the growing number and quality of French aircraft around Verdun by moving some of its airfields closer to the front. French pilots began to encounter German specialized all-fighter groups, equipped with nine Fokkers each. But the French pilots also noticed a growing performance edge in their own aircraft over the Fokkers. The Newport 17 could climb to 10,000 feet in 10 minutes, leaving the Fokker far behind. This is the French ace, Albert Derlin, testing the synchronized Vickers machine gun that made the Newports better still. In April 1916, a German pilot mistakenly landed a new Fokker E3 at an Allied airfield. It was tested against a French fighter. It was inferior. The Fokker scourge had already faded, but this was proof that it was over. New French aces appeared. Charles Nungesser ignored injuries, including a twice broken jaw and a dislocated knee, to reach 10 victories in the Battle of Verdun. Georges Guinemer, aristocratic and delicate, began a career over Verdun that would make him the most beloved French ace of the war. In June, Max Immermann, the great German pilot and tactician, was killed. Germany went into mourning. Oswald Bulker was now the top scoring ace of both sides with 18 victories. This is the French airbase at Luxeuil, in the far northeast of France, near the Swiss border. During the Great War, Luxeuil was the home of one of the earliest and most influential French bomber groups. Many lessons about bomber tactics were learned there early in 1915. Group bomber flights and the use of V formations were pioneered in its Maurice Farman aircraft.
Luxeuil Les Bains is an old spa town with natural hot springs. It became very fashionable in the time of Louis XV. By 1916, Luxeuil, like all bomber bases across the front, was changing. Better fighters and better anti-aircraft fire were forcing the abandonment of daylight raids deep into enemy territory. They were replaced by night raids against closer military targets. These aircraft are Farman F-40s, introduced in 1916. Crews disliked them because they had no defense against attacks from the rear. In spite of French government requests for more modern aircraft, the Farman company kept producing old-fashioned pusher designs. For bomber crews, night raids meant less chance of interception by enemy fighter aircraft or ground fire. But the night raids also meant greater navigation problems and less precision and intensity of attack. Supply of new aircraft continued to be slow. It would be some time before the unsafe and outdated Farmans could be replaced. In the spring of 1916, a group of newcomers arrived at Luxeuil. A fighter squadron of American volunteers, Elliot Cowden, Bert Thor, and Norman Prince, pressured for the establishment of the unit. A Frenchman, Captain Georges Tenot, was appointed commanding officer. Second in command, Lieutenant de Large de Mieux, was also French. The other founding members were Americans from a variety of backgrounds. James McConnell originally went to France to serve as a volunteer ambulance driver. At the time, the only way for Americans to fight for France and retain US citizenship was to join the French Foreign Legion. Kiffin Rockwell from North Carolina did just that. He was wounded in May 1915 fighting as a Foreign Legion foot soldier. After he recovered, he transferred to pilot training. Victor Chapman moved from the infantry, hoping for time above the trenches. These young men became the core of the squadron, known as the Escadrille Americaine. They were sent to remote Luxeuil and housed in a comfortable villa. They were supposed to learn to handle their Newport fighters and escort the Luxeuil bomber group. But at first, there was little action. Tenot took them on drives through the Vosges mountains to break the monotony. Kiffin Rockwell had the group's first victory in May 1916. Then they were moved to Verdun and the heart of the real war. The squadron had two famous lion cub mascots, whiskey and soda. Its members also had a reputation for living and playing hard. But they fought as fiercely as anyone else in the war and became an important symbol of potential American involvement. A group of idealistic young volunteers giving their lives to a cause they believed in. German diplomatic pressures in America forced a name change. The Escadrille Americaine became the Escadrille Lafayette. Victor Chapman was the first to die. Patrolling above Verdun, he proved to be too brave for his own good. He was hit in the head and his Newport was badly damaged. He landed, demanded a fresh aircraft and took off again. He charged five Fokkers behind German lines and was shot down. His was the first combat death in the war from a recognized American unit. The Escadrille lost Kiffin Rockwell, who'd had their first victory. It also lost Norman Prince, the major founder of the group, but not from enemy bullets. His Newport hit a power line as he was landing. 
James McConnell, the volunteer ambulance driver, also became a victim of battle. Thirty-eight American pilots would fly with the Escadrille before the United States entered the war in April 1917. Seven of them would die in action. Their numbers were small, but their influence on America's entry into the war was great. In June 1916, the British and French planned to launch a massive attack to divert German attention away from Verdun. The location of this offensive was the River Somme, towards the west end of the front line. British aircraft had been fighting above this valley for almost two years. Infantry and artillery were massed on a grand scale. The idea was that a mighty infantry assault would break the German line. Cavalry would then sweep through and ride to victory. Hundreds of thousands of men were involved. At a precise moment, they were to break out of their trenches and rush for the German line. A great artillery barrage was to prepare the way. The order was given at 7.30 on the morning of July the 1st, 1916. British troops, each man carrying 66 pounds of equipment, ran into no man's land. This is the little aerodrome at Saint-Omer, a few miles inland from the English Channel. Away from the thick of the fighting, Saint-Omer was the first destination for new aircraft flying from England. They would fly on from here to join their allocated squadrons and the war. Among the aircraft arriving at the time of the Somme battle were FE-2Ds. They were the latest version of a design that had been in service for much of the war. So far, Britain had built no equivalent of the French Newport. FE-2s and DH-2s with their old-fashioned pusher layouts were the best British fighters of the time. The observer sat in front. He had two Lewis guns, one firing forward and one back over the top wing. To use the rear gun, he had to stand up. FE-2Bs and Ds, in spite of their old-fashioned looks, could compete with and beat German Fokkers and Halberstadts. They were a major factor in building Allied air superiority before the Somme battle. But the Royal Flying Corps also depended heavily on French aircraft. The great British pilot Albert Ball established his reputation over the Somme. In three months, he had an amazing streak of 30 victories in a Newport 17. Throughout the summer, Allied planes dropped more than 17,000 bombs. They located German guns. They strafed German troops in the trenches. They were able to reinforce air superiority over the Somme. On the ground, the battle gained little for the Allies. Casualties on both sides were immense. In September, a new French fighter was ready to enter the war. It was a product of SPAD, a company owned by aviation pioneer Louis Blériot. Its designer was Louis Becherot, and it was called the SPAD 7. It had an inline Hispano Suiza engine, which handled quite differently from a rotary. The French ace Georges Guinemer was one of the first pilots to exploit the SPAD's potential. Guinemer arrived at the Somme in September with the Stork Escadrille No. 3 under Captain Brocard. His victories during that period brought him many decorations, including the Légion d'Honneur. By the end of 1916, he had brought down 25 enemy aircraft. 
Guinemer called his spad Vieux Charles, Old Charles. On one day, September the 23rd, 1916, he shot down three enemy aircraft. And then, while flying at 10,000 feet, he was himself shot down, but he was not injured. He made it back to the ground safely. German superiority in the air had disappeared. The months of the Fokker scourge were just a memory. The Spad 7 reinforced Allied fighter superiority. Pilots like Guinemer and Ball dominated the Western Front. But the pendulum was about to swing again. A new German fighter, the Albatross, was entering the war. For the Allied air services, 1917 would be a nightmare. A young aviator lay dying at the start of a bright summer's day. To the mechanics assembled around him, these few parting words he did say. Take the cylinder out of my kidneys, the connecting rod out of my brain. From the small of my back take the crankshaft and assemble the engine again. 